This talk is called uh, Accelerating HPC Applications with Maxella Dataflow Engines. And I just want to point out that the term acceleration is maybe even a little bit of a misnomer because you kind of think about, you know, doing it a little bit quicker or maybe, you know, as an alternative, you could you just wait a little bit longer or just buy more servers, right? That's always the easy answer. And that's not really what it's about. It's really about a, a more efficient way of computation and um, uh, essentially transforming applications in a way that they make a meaningful uh, difference from a business perspective as well. So um, I want to start with this one. Um, does anyone know what this is? That's right. So that's a Babbage uh, difference engine. This was the world's first computer. And, or at least it would have been. It didn't get built at the time because it was too expensive. But it was invented in the late uh, 1800s. And um, essentially, it's a calculating machine, mechanical. Um, this one is just a calculator, but there's a programmable version of this as well, which essentially makes it uh, more or less a computer in a modern sense, too. Um, and this was sort of invented as just a number crunching machine for engineering purposes. But then a, a mathematician called Ada Lovelace uh, kind of recognized that this could really do anything, right? So a programmable machine could maybe play music or something. It could carry out algorithms. So that was a very powerful idea. Um, but it's all kind of formulated as sequential computation. So here's an example of Bernoulli calculations. And it's a sequence of steps, right? So you do this, and you do this, and the next one, and the next one. And this sort of this notion of um, computing, you know, sequentially one step after another is basically stuck around, you know, until this day. So that's still with how we're programming CPUs, basically. And uh, it has basically brought us a long way, and you've all seen this slide. Uh, we're now using transistors in terms of kind of mechanical wheels. But fundamentally, the problem that we're running into is that some of the underlying te technologies are running out of steam. So um, first of all, you know, we know that the clock frequency is no longer uh, a driver in performance. So for a long time, it's quite easy to just make the CPU faster. And essentially, all your computations would run faster as well. Uh, now, that's no longer working as of 2000, 2005. And so the, the industry kind of came up with the idea of just you know, making more CPUs instead. Right? So we have now multi-core CPUs. And life is still good, so the single thread performance uh, drops off, but overall performance is still gr uh, growing by just using more cores. Um, now you could say, you know, why don't we just keep doing that? Um, there's a few problems with this. So first of all, you know, using more cores, and all of a sudden I'm kind of breaking the simplicity of the sequential uh, 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 notion that, I, that, I, that we had in the beginning. So I have to now think about programming in parallel. Um, the other thing is that we're actually now slowly running out of steam on the uh, Moore's law as well. So it looks like that Intel seems to have some issues with the 10, 10 nanometer node, which is you know, four years delayed now, um, seven nanometer, then how much more can we do? And then the question is, so once we're kind of done with the transistor count, so what's next? And, and this is where really where we have to come back to computer architecture and, and think about the way we're computing. Now, there's a second issue here, which is not really shown in this slide. But it's essentially the movement of, of data that becomes a, a real challenge. So here you see the, um, the energy that it's um, taken by, well, at the bottom you see the energy of taking uh, data to be transferred off chip to RAM uh, versus the energy on chip uh, transferred to register file or computed. And you see that the, the transfer of data to off chip memory is just hugely expensive. And even moving it on the chip has a meaningful energy impact. So um, what this means is that the, as sort of energy becomes a, a bigger problem, the, uh, the end game for computing really is moving data efficiently. It's not kind of flops or how many cores or anything like that. It's how efficiently can you move your data from one point to another uh, in order to just do more work with the remaining budget that you have in terms of energy. And this is really where data flow computing comes in. Um, so it's all about computing in a, in a spatial substrate, so not in a sequential manner, but in space. Uh, essentially, we're building very deep pipelines, uh, which uh, can have many, uh, up to thousands of stages. And the overall clock frequency is not so high, but we get co complete results at the end of each iteration. Uh, so, and of course, the real world analogy of this is a, a simple kind of manufacturing pipeline. And of course, this is how we typically make kind of large scale uh, productions, right? So if I make a, you know, mass produce a car, I don't have parallel production of cars where each worker makes his own car in parallel. Um, no, we have pipelines where things kind of move 
exactly to the right stage at the right time and results or inputs arrive where they need to be, highly specialized operations, and we get results at the outputs. Um, so the nice thing about this is that essentially more pipeline stages means more performance. That means the more code I write in programming this thing, uh, the more performance I get, and the more pipelines I do in parallel, again, the more performance I get. So that's simply the uh, abstraction that we're using. Now, what does a data flow engine actually look like? I mean, it's, it's essentially quite simple. We take a large FPGA, uh, which gives us a configurable spatial substrate to do the computation, uh, and we surround this with as much memory as we can, and uh, then we try to use uh, as many high-speed interfaces as possible. So, of course, there's Pisa Express that needs to be fast and connects us to the CPU. Um, then we have some networking interfaces, uh, and then we have a thing over there called Max Ring, which is a direct connection to other DFEs, and, and that's important. So I'll come back to that a little bit later. So keep that in mind. Uh, and then, of course, we can take these cards and put them into a machine, so that's the boring part. So I guess we can make systems out of this. Um, here in this one, we have eight cards in one U, so that's, in fact, a very dense and high-performance uh, 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 node that you can get. It's highly integrated and uh, air-cooled still, uh, so that's you know, it's difficult to squeeze more compute in, into a one U unit. Um, but we're not the only ones who are doing this. I mean, this is now becoming a you know, reasonably popular idea, and there's ma many other uh, ones that are doing kind of similar compute substrates. So obviously, Amazon launched their uh, F1 instances, which uh, use a very uh, similar architecture to, uh, to the Maxella, the recent Maxella uh, DFE, and that's not a complete coincidence. Uh, there's also Xilinx, of course, a new data flow, uh, data, what they call data center card, uh, Alveo, that was recently launched at the uh, developer forum um, earlier this month. And the nice thing about these two platforms is they're both uh, supported by Maxella, right? So you can now use Max Compiler to develop for an F1 instance. Uh, you can use Max Compiler to develop for Alveo. Uh, the only thing that changes in your code is just one line where you say what the target is. That's it. And that really allows you to take existing applications, moving them to different platforms, uh, deploying them on the cloud if you want to, or on this uh, data center platform. And so we can really expand into more kind of commercial systems that are out there. So how do we actually do this? Um, essentially, it means that you have to take your algorithm and describe it in a sort of a data flow manner. Uh, so here's an example of, well, a high level example of Conigan Gradient. And essentially, what you have to do is sort of describe this as a pipeline. Uh, so it's not really in the scope of this talk to really tell you how all this works. And I could just sort of give you a super high-level introduction and, and basically say we have this language that's called MaxJ. It's a sort of a meta language based on Java. Um, there, we have developed many data flow extensions for this. And essentially, what you're doing is you're describing uh, graphs, right? So pipelines, really. And um, but it's not just about, you know, I don't want to go too much in the programming itself. It's not just about the language itself. It's that the overall methodology has, um, we found, really high productivity compared to other approaches uh, because it's high level enough to kind of make it productive. But at the same time, it sort of allows you to reason about the application in terms of its, its target, the spatial compute substrate, so that you can sort of think in terms of um, spatial comp uh, computing, using, you know, building pipelines. Uh, thinking about I.O. and so on. And in addition to that, um, to the compiler, there's sort of many supportive tools, like, for example, this visualization uh, that shows you the, the pipeline that you've just written. Um, there's a debugger. Uh, there is a tool to uh, simulate the uh, numerics. So if you want to use custom number formats, like fixed point, which has a huge potential, you can profile what values you're actually hitting throughout the computation so you can optimize for the number format and say, well, if it's kind of within a certain range, then you can truncate the or reduce the number of bits that you need to compute uh, with. Uh, we can visualize the overlapping of the computation of how often you're on the CPU versus on the accelerator, and of course you want to maximize both. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of supportive uh, methodology here to make it really work as a comprehensive development uh, environment. On the uh, subject of fixed point, I just want to bring this up. So when you say 
you know, fixed point and HPC, people typically say, well, you can't possibly do this. You know, it needs to be double position floating point um, because that gives you the correct answer. And that's not true, right? So first of all, double precision is not correct. And uh, you can do fixed point if, if you know what you're doing. And so practically, you know, it typically means that you need to kind of start looking at the output and you need to understand how good of an output you need. I mean, that's essentially the same when you decide whether you would want you know, single or double position or something like this. And in this example, this is an example from oil and gas exploration where you get this underground structure and what conveys meaning at the output of this image. So someone needs to look at this image and they need to recognize the structure. And it turns out that if you go from floating point to fixed point, there are bit errors. I mean, it's not bit level equivalent, but it's the same image. It has the same meaning. So you can look at both and you see the same structure Whereas if I go over to this one, which has a lower precision, it does not convey the same meaning, so it kind of breaks down. So by sort of understanding what I need at the output, I can go back, and it turns out in this case, 10-bit uh, 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 fixed point is enough. 8-bit is not good enough, so practical example. So I want to briefly just go into a few applications that we worked on. Uh, oil and gas was, you know, from the previous example, is one of the first things we did, and here the the benefit of this application really was not acceleration per se, but being able to have a, a higher resolution of the image that was uh, computed with our machine. Then we sort of went into oil, uh, we went from oil and gas into computational finance. Uh, so the example here was that overnight risk calculations were accelerated to a matter of minutes. So, so this is really a kind of transformation where you no longer basically wait overnight for the result of the, the computation, but you could do it throughout the day, which meant for the, the customer in question they could really change their models and track risk far more accurately. But this is kind of a number of years ago, so this is a, a typical kind of deployment with a large kind of on-site uh, machine, whereas now we can do a similar thing um, on the Amazon Cloud. We have, for example, here on F1, you can have a Maxella application called Real-Time Risk, uh, and essentially it's risk calculations, it's a toolbox for various things. Um, again, the idea is that financial institutions have a lot of pressure to, to manage risk and they have large portfolios, but at the same time they want to get results quickly, which is sort of a contradicting goal. So the accelerator really kind of helps to, to deliver that. Um, the interesting thing is, so once you kind of go to a cloud, um, a cloud setup, is that people don't really ask about acceleration factors anymore. They don't really say, you know, how much faster is it versus the CPU. No, it's just a, you know, it has a certain capability, a certain performance level, and uh, that you can just buy and run on the cloud, and that's it. So it's, it's really just a standalone product. Um, it really changes the, the narrative a bit from a, let's say, conventional uh, deployment. Uh, quick example in physics, QCD is one of these applications that can run for hours or even days or months, depending on what scale you're running this on. We have uh, developed a data flow acceleration for this. And this was first developed in the context of the Praise project. So we deployed a machine at the Ulich Supercomputing Center in the combination of this, this effort. Uh, so if anyone wants to collaborate with uh, Ulich, uh, they have a, a nice new Maxella system. But again, this QCD application was also converted into a cloud uh, application. So again, you can run this on F1. So I really sort of want to kind of wrap this up and give you one last example of an application and give you just a kind of a very brief flavor of, of how we can actually meaningful, uh, uh, transform applications in a, in a meaningful way. So quantum espresso is computa uh, computational chemistry. It is also very intensive. Um, it was one of the, again, one of the price applications. And here you might just say, okay, you know, let's do this. Let's look at some profiling information. Let's find the kind of hot functions and then do some accelerators for them, right? Easy. Uh, well, you know, I could do this, and I see that uh, FFTW takes a reasonable amount of compute time, so I can try to accelerate this. But if I kind of did it this way, I would you know, really achieve uh, a result that is suboptimal. Uh, so what we do instead is with our tools and methodology, we first kind of construct it into a representation that shows flow of information rather than, let's say, you know, a call graph or something like that. And here you see, you know, there's an outer loop, then in this outer loop, there's something called the diagonalization loop. And then inside that, there's something that's called the FFT loop. So there's an inverse FFT, multiplication, FFT again. And then I go into some matrix multiplies. And 
so all of a sudden, you know, you see this is a much more kind of meaningful representation of how information moves through the uh, system. And uh, so the first thing is we could just work on the FFT part. And again, we don't do a standalone accelerator for FFT. We do this one, which is uh, basically the IFFT, the multiplication, and the FFT on one DFE, so on one accelerator. So this means that there's a relatively small amount of information now coming from the CPU, where a lot of the domain data just stays in this DFE, and the high bandwidth is just between the local DDR and this DFE. Uh, so by, by basically uh, converging more information or uh, more computation into this uh, one accelerator, um, I'm getting a much better solution already. But we can take it even one further, where, you know, on the previous, uh, if I go back here, I showed you that there is a lot of information moving from the FFT to these uh, Z-gems. So I can build an accelerator where um, I take these two DFEs and they're connected through max range. So what I showed you earlier is this local interconnect, and I can now do high-speed data transfers directly between these cards. Uh, they don't go to the CPU at all, so they're just moving from FFT to ZGM and back. Uh, and only the CPU is responsible for initials of inputs and collecting results. So this is an example of really deconstructing an application and uh, having something that is just a lot more than just throwing an accelerator in the mix. It's, it's really kind of reasoning about the flow of information and building something that is suitable uh, to the um, nature of the application. So in this case, unfortunately, we couldn't really compete with a blue gene machine because it's a much larger machine and we just have a kind of a small system, so we can't really compare uh, the uh, performance as such. But we can at least demonstrate that this is uh, 30 times lower energy uh, in computing the same thing. So I want to conclude by just showing this one so we can, of course, now move the same kind of concept to the edge as well. So we are making a small edge computation box, which we call a, a mini DFE, which essentially applies the same concept to applications where I need to do some local decision making, pre-filtering, and so on. So thank you.